On July 23, I met General von Thoma in Talashkino, who had replaced General von Weber as commander of the 17th Panzer Division. General Thoma was known as an old and experienced tanker, having distinguished himself during the First World War and the Spanish War. He possessed iron calmness and outstanding bravery, and in this war he also lived up to the expectations placed on him. The 17th Panzer Division provided the link between the 46th and 47th Panzer Corps, and held the front on the Dianetha, preventing the Russians from breaking through to the south, which was still feared by the 4th Army Command. The command post of the 46th Tank Corps was in the woods, 11 kilometers west of Yelnya. General Fatinov reported to me about the Russian counterattack on Yelnya, which is being conducted from the southeast and north with very strong artillery support. Due to the shortage of ammunition experienced since the beginning of the war, the corps was firing only at the most important targets. Fitinov wanted to advance towards Dorogobush to support Gotha as soon as the Great Germania Infantry Regiment was replaced by the 18th Panzer Division. All attempts to advance across the Yusha River northwest of Yelnya, in the direction towards Sevilla Kalushie, were unsuccessful. The road Glinka, Kimiatino, marked on our maps as good, in reality did not exist at all. The road to the north was sinking and impassable for vehicles. All movements had to be made only in foot formation and were therefore tedious and time-consuming. I then went to the 10th Armoured Division, where General Charles gave me a detailed picture of the fighting at Yelnia. His troops had destroyed 50 enemy tanks in one day, but were stopped at well-equipped Russian positions. He believed that the division had lost at least one-third of all its tanks. Ammunition had to be brought from points located 450 kilometers from the location of the division. From here I went to the SS Division Reich, which was located north of Yelnya. The division had captured 1,100 prisoners the day before, but from the yelnya dorogo Bouge line it could not advance any further. Heavy bombing attacks of the Russians from the air delayed the further advance of the division. I went to the positions of the combat guard, commanded by Hauptsturmführer Klingenberg, to personally familiarize myself with the terrain and the situation. I concluded that I should wait for the arrival of the Great Germania Infantry Regiment before launching an offensive in the direction of dorogo Bouge. At 2300 hours, I arrived at the new command post of my group, located two kilometers south of Prudka. The fierce attacks of the Russians continued for several days with unrelenting force. Still, we managed to advance somewhat on the right flank. On the central section of the front of the group arrived long-awaited reinforcements, the 18th Panzer Division, and one infantry division. Attempts to advance in the direction of Dorogobus invariably ended in complete failure. According to the latest intelligence, we should have expected the appearance of the headquarters of the four new Russian armies east of the line novgorod siversky west of Bryansk, Yelnya, Ryzhev, Ostashkov. All along this line, the Russians were making engineering works. By July 25, the compounds of the tank group reached 1st Cavalry Division, the area southeast of Novi Baikov, 4th Armored Division, the line Cherikov, Krejciv, 10th Motor Division, Aishibaikov, 3rd Armored Division, Lobkovici, 263rd Infantry Division, 5th Machine Gun Battalion, Great Germany Infantry Regiment, 18th Armored Division and 292nd Infantry Division, the area south of Prudki and the Shatalovo airfield, where our short-range bombers were based and which we had to secure from Russian artillery and mortar fire. The 10th Armored Division was at Yelna, the SS Reich Division north of Yelna. The 17th Armored Division was at Chensovo and south, the 29th Motorized Division south of Smolensk, and the 137th Infantry Division at Smolensk. Enemy cavalry appeared on the highway near Bobrysk. On July 26, the Russians continued their offensive in the area of Yelnya. I asked the command to transfer the 268th Infantry Division to the Yelninsky Ark in order to strengthen this section of the front and to give the tank troops a chance to rest and tidy up their equipment, which they urgently needed after long marches and fierce fighting. In the afternoon, I visited the 3rd Armoured Division, congratulated Model on the award of the Knight's Cross, which he well deserved, and heard his report on the positions of the division. I then went to the 4th Armoured Division, where I met with General Baron von Geyer and General Baron von Langerman. Toward evening I received a report that the Russians had broken through the 137th Infantry Division's pre-bridge fortification on the north bank of the Dini Pier near Smolensk. Radio reconnaissance established that there was interaction between the Russian 21st Army at Gomol 
the 13th Army at Rotnia, and the 4th Army south of Roslovel. On the same day, Gotha's troops succeeded in closing the ring around the Russian forces east of Smolensk from the north. The remnants of ten Russian divisions were defeated by our third tank group. In addition, were destroyed large enemy forces operating in the rear of our troops, near returning to my command post at 22 hours. I received an order from the headquarters of the army group to arrive at the meeting by 12 o'clock. The next day at the Orsha airfield, it was necessary to discuss some issues, because in recent days there was a divergence in the assessment of the situation. While the command of the 4th Army believed that the most threatened section of the front is the area of Smolensk, the command of the tank group believed that the most dangerous are the areas south of Roslavl and east of Yelnya. Unnecessary concentration of large formations in the Smolensk area was the reason that in recent days in the area of Roslavl created a critical situation and suffered heavy losses that could have been avoided. All this extremely aggravated my relations with the commander of the 4th Army. On July 27, I flew with my chief of staff, Lieutenant Colonel von Leibenstein, to Borisov to receive instructions on the further development of operations and to report on the situation of my troops. I expected to receive an order to attack in the direction of Moscow or at least Bryansk, but to my surprise, I was informed that Hitler ordered the 2nd Army and the 2nd Panzer Group to attack Gomel. In addition, the second panzer group was additionally tasked to advance in a southwestern direction in order to encircle the 810 Russian divisions remaining in the area. We were told that the Fury adheres to the point of view that large encompassing operations are the wrong theory of the general staff, a theory that justified itself only in the West. The main task on the Russian front is to destroy the enemy's manpower, which can only be achieved by creating small cauldrons. All participants in the meeting believe that such actions will give the enemy the opportunity to gain time to prepare new formations and, using their inexhaustible human resources, to create new lines of defense in the rear, and that the campaign which we will conduct in this way will not lead to a quick and so necessary for us to end the war. Until a few days ago, the general command of the army was also of quite a different opinion. The following extract from an official document in my possession dated July 23, 1941, attests to this. The decision on the further development of operations is based on the assumption that after the operational objective 1-1 is achieved in accordance with the plan of strategic deployment, the bulk of the combat-ready forces of the Russian army will be defeated. On the other hand, we must reckon with the fact that the enemy will be able to organize stubborn resistance in the most important directions of further advance of German troops, using for this purpose its large human reserves and put into action all their forces, it should be expected that the most stubborn resistance to the Russians will be in the Ukraine, near Moscow and near Leningrad. The plan of the general command of the land forces is to destroy the existing or newly created enemy forces and through the rapid capture of the most important industrial areas of the Ukraine, areas located west of the Volga, as well as Tula, Gorky, Rybinsk, Moscow and Leningrad, deprive the enemy of the material base for the restoration of its military industry. The resulting separate tasks for each group of armies and the general grouping of forces will be communicated first by telegraph and then in a detailed directive. Whatever Hitler's decision, it was necessary for the second panzer group first of all to finally eliminate the danger that threatened its right flank. On this basis, I reported to the army group commander about my decision to attack Roslavl in order to capture this junction of roads, to be able to seize the roads going to the east, south and southwest, and asked him to allocate me the necessary forces for this operation. My proposal was approved, and for its implementation the second tank group was subordinated to the following company for the offensive on Roslov. The 7th Army Corps, consisting of the 7th, 23rd, 78th and 197th Infantry Divisions, and the 9th Army Corps, consisting of the 263rd, 292nd and 137th Infantry Divisions need to replace the tank divisions in need of rest and tidying up in the area of the Yelinsky Ark. The 20th Army Corps, consisting of the 15th and 268th Infantry Divisions. The 1st Cavalry Division was reassigned to the 2nd Army. The tank group was separated from the 4th Army, and my troops henceforth received the name Guderian's Army Group. The attack on Roslavl, in order to eliminate the threat from the flank, was organized as follows. The 24th Panzer Corps was assigned the task by the forces of two divisions of the 7th Army Corps to provide the stretched right flank from the enemy's actions in the area of Klimovici. 
Miloslavici. The above-mentioned two divisions together with the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions were to seize the town of Roslavo and establish communication with the 9th Army Corps, which was operating to the north, in the area between the rivers Oster and Desna. The 7th Army Corps was tasked with the 23rd and 197th Infantry Divisions from the area of Petrovici, his Lavici to advance in the direction of Roslavo, where to join the 3rd Panzer Division and develop the offensive in the direction of the highway Rezlavo, Stodolishk, Smolensk, the 78th Infantry Division was in the 2nd Echelon. The 9th Army Corps, with the forces of the 263rd Infantry Division, was to advance from north to south, between the above-mentioned highway and the Oster River, and with the forces of the 292nd Infantry Division, between the Oster and Desna rivers, delivering the main blow with its left flank in the direction of the highway Roslavo Ikimovici, Moscow. The left flank of the 9th Corps was to be provided by the 137th Infantry Division, transferred from Smolensk. In addition, the 9th Army Corps was reinforced by units of the 47th Tank Corps, mainly its artillery. The beginning of the offensive was scheduled for the 24th Panzer Corps, and the 7th Army Corps on August 1, and for the 9th Army Corps on August 2. The remaining days were spent in preparation for the offensive. Special attention had to be paid to the Army Corps at my disposal, which had so far almost never had to take part in combat operations against the Russians, and were unfamiliar with my methods of conducting offensive operations. These troops had not yet had to act in close cooperation with tanks, so I doubted the success of their actions. Particular doubt was caused by the 9th Army Corps, which was commanded by General Geyer, well known to me as my former Chief of Service in the Department of Troops of the Ministry of the Reichswehr, as well as the commander of the 5th Military District to which the garrison of Würzburg was subordinate. General Geyer was known for his sharp mind, noted by General Ludendorff as early as the First World War. Naturally, he saw through and all the weaknesses of my method of attack and spoke about them at a meeting attended by corps commanders. To his objections to my tactics, I answered him that this method of attack is mathematics, implying that its success is beyond any doubt. General Geyer, however, was not easily persuaded of my correctness, and I had to endure a difficult struggle with my former superior at this meeting, which took place in a small Russian school. Only in the course of hostilities, Geyer became convinced of the correctness of my method and, showing great personal courage, contributed substantially to the success of our offensive. July 29. Hitler's chief adjutant, Colonel Schmunt, brought me oak leaves to the Knight's Cross and, taking advantage of this circumstance, had a conversation with me about my views on the future. He informed me that Hitler had outlined three objectives in Ingrad in the northeast. This goal must be achieved at all costs in order to be able to organize from Sweden on the Baltic Sea to supply Army Group North. In the center is Moscow, which is an important industrial center. In the southeast is Ukraine. From the statements of Schmund, could be concluded that Titler has not yet made a final decision on the offensive in Ukraine. Therefore, I urged Schmund to convince Hitler of the necessity of striking directly at Moscow the heart of Russia, and advise him to abandon the application of small strikes, which led to heavy losses on our part and were not decisive for the success of the entire campaign. In addition, I asked Schmand not to delay the delivery to me of new tanks and resupply, for otherwise the campaign could not be quickly completed. On July 30, 13 attacks were repulsed at Yolnaya. On July 31, Major von Belov, a communications officer sent by me, returned from the general command of the army and delivered me the following instructions. The previously planned task to reach the line one Gully Lake, Volga River by October 1, is now considered unfeasible. There is confidence that by this time the troops will reach the line of Leningrad, Moscow and areas south of Moscow. The general command of the army and the chief of general staff are in an extremely difficult situation as the management of all operations are carried out from above. The final decision on the further course of operations has not yet been made. From the final decision on the issue of further development of operations now depended on everything. In particular, the expediency of holding the front line at the Ark of Yilna in the event that the offensive in the direction of Moscow will not be carried out. The defense of this Ark was associated with heavy losses. The supply of ammunition was insufficient for position warfare, and this was not surprising. 
for the nearest railroad station with sufficient capacity was 750 kilometers away, although the railroad track to Orsha was converted to the German gauge. But the capacity of the road was still insignificant. There were not enough Russian steam locomotives for those sections of the track that had not yet been resurfaced. There was still a small hope that Hitler would make a different decision, as we were told at a meeting convened on July 27 by the command of Army Group Center in Borisov. August 1. The 24th Panzer Corps and the 7th Army Corps began the offensive on Roslavl. Early in the morning I first of all went to the 7th Army Corps, but found neither the command post of the Corps nor the command post of the 23rd Infantry Division, searching for them at 9 o'clock. I reached the head-mounted sentries of the 23rd Infantry Division. Having ascertained that there could be no headquarters ahead, I halted, demanding of the sentries that they report to me what information they had about the enemy. The cavalrymen were extremely surprised at my unexpected appearance. I then ordered the commander of the 67th Infantry Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Baron von Bissing, my old neighbor in Berlin, to let the regimental units pass me by. It was noticeable that the soldiers, recognizing me, were very pleased. Going then to the 3rd Panzer Division, I was bombed by our planes which dropped bombs on units of the 23rd Infantry Division and caused them great damage. The first bomb fell 50 meters ahead of my vehicle. These unfortunate incidents occurred despite the fact that our troops had the necessary identification marks and the routes of movement were specified in the orders. This is explained by the insufficient training of young pilots and their lack of combat experience. Otherwise, the advance of the units of the 23rd Infantry Division did not meet serious resistance. In the afternoon, I arrived at the advanced units of the 3rd Armored Division, which had reached the west bank of the Oster River, south of Horonovo. General Model informed me that he had captured all bridges over the Oster River undestroyed and had also taken one enemy battery. I talked with the commanders of battalions, special units, and thanked them for the good leadership of their units. In the evening I visited the headquarters of the 24th Tank Corps to get general information about the progress of the offensive for the whole day, and the next day at two o'clock returned to my command post. My trip lasted 22 hours. The main object of our offensive, Roslavl, had been captured. On the morning of August 2, I went to the 9th Army Corps. From the command post of the 509th Infantry Regiment of the 292nd Infantry Division, I could observe the retreat of the Russians. I ordered to continue the offensive in a southerly direction, overruling an objection from the Corps' command. I then went to the 507th Infantry Regiment, whose advance party was advancing on Kozaki. Toward the end of the day, I still visited the headquarters of the 137th Infantry Division and the headquarters of the regiments of this division, ordering them to continue the offensive during the night and to reach the highway leading to Moscow as quickly as possible. At 2 p.m., I returned to my command post. During August 2, the 9th Corps had not made any significant gains, so I decided to spend the day of August 3 again in this corps to develop further the offensive and ensure complete success. I went first to the command post of the 292nd Infantry Division at Kowali, and from there to the 507th Infantry Regiment. On the way I met the corps commander, with whom I discussed the progress of the fighting in detail. Arriving at the 507th Infantry Regiment, I went forward with the lead company, eliminating unnecessary stops. Three kilometers from the big Moscow highway in binoculars were spotted tanks that were northeast of Roslavl. We immediately suspended the movement. I ordered the self-propelled gun, which was moving with the lead infantry unit, to give the tanks the conditional signal I am here and received a signal in return, which meant that they were our tanks. It was a unit of the 35th Tank Regiment of my 4th Armoured Division. I immediately got into my car and went to my tankers. The remnants of the Russian troops were dropping their weapons and retreating, and soldiers from the 2nd Company of the 35th Tank Regiment were climbing the beams and planks of the blown bridge over the Ostrich River to greet. It was the same company that my eldest son had commanded not so long ago. The soldiers loved him very much and transferred their love and trust to me. Oberlieutenant Kraus, who now commanded this company, reported to me the situation and I wished the company further success. Thus, the ring of encirclement around the Russian troops in the neighborhood of Roslavl was closed. In the encirclement remained three or four Russian divisions. The task was now to force the encircled Russians to surrender. When General Geyer appeared half an hour later, 
I told him that the highway to Moscow must be held at all costs. The 292nd Infantry Division was assigned the task of closing the encirclement ring with the front to the west, and the 137th Infantry Division with the front to the east, along the Desna River. Meanwhile, in the area of Yelnya continued heavy fighting, which required a large consumption of ammunition. Here was thrown into battle our last reserve, a company guarding the command post of our tank group. In Zatran, the troops of the group reach. 7th Infantry Division and 3rd Armoured Division, the area west of Klimovici, 10th Motorized Division, High Slavici. 78th Infantry Division, Ponyatovkok. 23rd Infantry Division, Roslavl, 197th Infantry Division, and 5th Machine Gun Battalion. North of Roslavl, 263rd Infantry Division. South of Prutki, 292nd Infantry Division. Kozaki, 137th Infantry Division, the eastern bank of the river. Desna, 10th Armoured Division, 286th Infantry Division, SS Division Reich, Infantry Regiment Great Ge Yelnya, 17th Armoured Division, north of Yelnya, 29th Motorized Division, south of Smolensk, 18th Armoured Division, Prudki. The headquarters of the 20th Army Corps had just arrived. On the morning of August 4, I was summoned to the headquarters of the Army Group, where for the first time since the beginning of the campaign in Russia was to make a report Hitler. We stood on the eve of a decisive turn in the course of the war. The meeting with Hitler took place in the city of Borisov, where the headquarters of Army Group Center was located. Present, Heitler, Schmundi, Field Marshal von Bock, Goth and I, as well as a representative of the OKH in Chief of Operations, Colonel Hughes. Each participant in the meeting was given the opportunity to take turns to express his point of view in such a way that no one knew what the previous participant in the meeting was talking about. All the generals of Army Group Center were unanimous in favor of continuing the offensive on Moscow, which was of decisive importance. Goth stated that his tank group could not begin the offensive until August 20 at the earliest. I stated that I would be ready by August 15. Hitler then spoke in the presence of all participants in the meeting. He stated that his first target is the industrial area of Leningrad. The question of whether to then attack Moscow or the Ukraine has not yet been finally decided. Hitler himself was inclined to begin with an offensive in the Ukraine, for now Army Group South had also made some progress. In addition, he believed that the raw materials and food resources of Ukraine are essential for the further conduct of the war, and that, finally, the offensive in Ukraine will give him the opportunity to knock out of Russian hands Crimea, which, according to Hitler, is the aircraft carrier of the Soviet Union, from where raids are conducted on the oil fields of Romania. By early winter, he hoped to seize Moscow and Kharkov. The final decision on this most important issue for us on the further course of the war on this day was not taken. Then the meeting moved on to the consideration of individual issues. As for my tank group, the most important thing for it was to achieve the abandonment of the intention to withdraw our troops from the area of the Yelna Bulge, because this bulge could later be the initial area for the offensive on Moscow. I emphasized the necessity of replacing our engines, which were wearing out very quickly here because of the unprecedented dust. If only this year was expected to carry out operations requiring tanks to overcome long distances. We also needed our losses in tanks to be made up with new tanks. After some hesitation, Hitler promised to allocate to the entire Eastern Front 300 tank engines, a number that could not satisfy me in any way. In receiving new tanks, we were denied at all, as Hitler intended all new tanks for the new tank formations being formed in Germany. When discussing this issue, I pointed out to Hitler the fact that the Russians have a large superiority in tanks, which will increase if the losses in tanks we have the same. If I knew that the Russians really have such a number of tanks, which was cited in your book, I would probably not have started this war. In my book Attention, Tanks, published in 1937, I indicated that at that time Russia had 10,000 tanks, but this figure was objected to by Chief of General Stafbeck, as well as the censorship. I had great difficulty in obtaining permission to publish these figures, although in reality the information at my disposal indicated that the Russians had 17,000 tanks at that time, and I myself was extremely cautious in publishing the information available. In the face of imminent danger, one cannot follow an ostrich policy. But Hitler and his most authoritative political, economic and military advisers have consistently followed such a policy. This policy of forcibly closing their eyes to the harsh reality led to disastrous results. 
the consequences of which we have to suffer even now. Returning from the meeting, I decided, just in case, to begin preparations for an offensive on Moscow. At my command post, I learned that the Ninth Army Corps, fearing a Russian breakthrough in the southeastern part of the cauldron at Yemolino, left the Moscow Highway, and that there was a danger of Russian troops breaking through the ring of encirclement, closed on August 3. Early in the morning of August 5, I hurried to go to the area of the Seventh Corps in order to go from there to the Moscow Highway and again close the gap from the south. On the way I met units of the 15th Infantry Division, proceeding to the Yelny area. I briefed the division commander on the situation in the area. Then I went to the 197th Infantry Division, where its commander, General Maya Rabinjin, reported to me that in the ring of encirclement of the Russians formed a gap and that the Russians, in any case, keep under their fire on the Moscow Highway. Upon arrival at the 4th Armoured Division, I learned that the tanks of the 35th Tank Regiment were pulled back. I immediately radioed the order to the tank corps, assigning it the responsibility for holding the Moscow Highway, and myself went to the 7th Army Corps. This corps had already sent a reconnaissance detachment of the 23rd Infantry Division with the task of preventing the Russians to break out of the cauldron. I thought that the measures taken were completely insufficient, and together with the Chief of Staff of the 7th Army Corps, Colonel Krebs, my old friend from the times of our joint service in Goslar, went to Roslavl. In Roslavl I met a tank company of Oberlutnant Kraus, which was on its way to rest. The commander of this company was still in the combat area. The company held back until morning the enemy's attempts to break out of the encirclement ring, destroyed many guns, and captured a considerable number of prisoners. The company was then ordered to withdraw. I immediately turned back the brave company, ordering it to return and occupy the former line. I then ordered the 2nd Battalion, 332nd Infantry Regiment, to begin advancing toward the bridge over the Ostrich River. Finally, I alerted an anti-aircraft artillery unit located near Roslavl and then headed toward the front line. Looking at the bridge over the Ostrich River, I noticed a group of about 100 Russians approaching the bridge from the north. This group was dispersed. The tanks crossed the bridge, which had been repaired in recent days, and prevented the Russians from breaking out of the encirclement. After the tanks had restored communication with the 137th Infantry Division, I returned to the command post of the 7th Army Corps, assigning the responsibility for holding the threatened area near the Moscow Highway to the artillery commander of the 7th Corps, the able and proven Austrian General Martitik, and then returned by Storch airplane to my command post. From there, I transmitted orders to the 9th Army Corps to establish communication with Martinex Group. My headquarters, I set the task to prepare an offensive on Moscow with such a calculation that the tank corps had the opportunity to act on the right flank, advancing along the Moscow Highway, and the infantry corps would attack in the centre and on the left flank. I intended to make the main blow to my right flank and breaking through a rather weak at this time. The Russian front in this area move along the Moscow Highway towards Spazdemensk and Vyazma, thus contributing to the advance of the group of Gotha and then develop the offensive on Moscow. Fascinated by these plans of mine, I strongly resisted to fulfil the demand of the OK, which I received on August 6, which was to direct my tank divisions to attack Rogachev, located near the Dnipier, far behind the front line I occupied. My reconnaissance had established that day that there was almost no enemy for a considerable distance around Roslav. In the direction to Bryansk and to the south, the enemy was not completely detected at a distance of 40 kilometers. These data were confirmed the next day. By August 8, it was already possible to summarize some results of the battles for Roslal. Our troops captured a large number of prisoners, tanks, and guns. These results were extremely joyful and significant. Nothing to be foregoing on the offensive to Moscow or undertaking any other operation. We had to fulfill one more condition beforehand, to secure our right flank at Krichev, located by a deep ledge backwards. Clearing this flank of enemy troops was also necessary to facilitate the 2nd Army's advance on Rogachev. Both the command of Army Group Centre and the command of the tank group believed that this would eliminate the need to send tank forces to the area of operations of the 2nd Army and the high wear and tear of material caused by long marches. Both headquarters believe that our main goal should be the development of the offensive to Moscow. However, despite this, from the headquarters of the army group, apparently under pressure from the OK, 
still continued to receive repeated demands to transfer some tank units in the direction of Propoisk. All misunderstandings related to these demands were settled by the decision of General Gaia, who wanted to get rid of the constant pressure on his right flank by attacking the enemy south of Krychiv in the Miloslavici area. I agreed with this decision, having also received the approval of the Army Group headquarters, which had abandoned its demand to send tanks in the direction of Propoisk. On August 8, I went to the corps and divisions located in Roslavl and to the south. And on August 9, I was present at the offensive of the 24th Tank Corps, being with the 4th Tank Division, the 35th Tank and 12th Motorized Rifle Regiments, excelled in the offensive and were properly supported by the artillery of Colonel Schneider. On August 10, for reasons unknown to me, an order was received to send the 2nd Tank Division to France, which until then had been in reserve of the OK. The 2nd Army's offensive on Gommel had been delayed recently by the poor condition of the roads. During August 10, the troopships of the group we are per 7th Intision, in the area south of Hotovaj. 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions were on the offensive southwest of Miloslavici. 10th Motorized Division, Miloslavici. 78th Infantry Division, in Sloboda, its advanced detachment, in Bukano, 197th Infantry Division, in Ostrovaya, its advanced detachment, in Aleshnia, 29th Motorized Division, in Roslavl, 23rd Infantry Division, on rest north of Roslavl, 137th and 263rd Infantry Divisions, on the line of the river, Desna, 268th, 292nd and 15th Infantry Divisions, in the area of the Yelna Ark, 10th Panzer Division, west of Yelna, 17th Panzer Division, northwest of Yelna, 18th Panzer Division, east of Prudki, 6th Division Reich, northwest of Yelna, where the Regiment Great German was also on rest and was being completed. So far, all the activities carried out by my tank group were based on our perception that both the Army Group Command and the Oak considered the attack on Moscow as the most decisive operation. I was still hoping that, despite the results of the meeting in Borisov on August 4, Hitler would eventually still agree with this, as it seemed to me the most reasonable plan. On August 11, however, I had to bury that hope. The Oak rejected my plan to attack Moscow by means of a main strike from Roslau to Vyazma, considering this plan unacceptable. No other better plan Oak Age did not make, showing during the following days a series of endless hesitation which made it completely impossible for any forward planning by lower headquarters. The Army Group Command had apparently reconciled itself to the fact that my plan of attack had been rejected, although as late as August 4 it had supported it. Unfortunately, I was not then aware that a few days later Hitler agreed to the idea of an offensive on Moscow, and his consent was contingent on the fulfilment of certain preconditions. In any case, the OK was not then able to take advantage of this fleeting consent of Hitler. A few days later, the matter turned out differently again. On August 13, I visited the front line along the Desna River east of Roslavl, which ran on both sides of the Moscow Highway. With pain in my heart, I observed how the troops, in full confidence that they would soon be advancing on the Russian capital, had already prepared roadboards and signs with the inscriptions to Moscow. The soldiers of the 137th Infantry Division, with whom I had to talk during my visit to the front line, only talked about the resumption of the offensive to the east in the near future. By August 14, the battles that the 24th Panzer Corps had fought in the Krychev area had been successfully completed. Many prisoners, artillery pieces and other trophies were captured. Our troops captured Kostyukovici. After my proposal to attack, Moscow was rejected. I made a logical proposal to withdraw troops from the Ark of Yilna, which we no longer needed, where we were always suffering heavy losses. However, the Army Group Command and the OKA rejected my proposal, which was based on the need to save human lives. It was rejected under the ridiculous pretext that the enemy in this section of the front is even more difficult than we are. During the day of August 15, I had to spend a lot of effort to persuade my superiors to abandon their intention to take advantage of the success of the 24th Tank Corps to go on the offensive to Gomel. In my eyes, such a march of the corps in the direction to the southwest was tantamount to a retreat. The Army Group Command tried to take one tank division from the corps to realize this goal, not taking into account, however, the fact that it is impossible to carry out such an operation with the forces of one division. 
it would have to put into battle the entire 24th Panzer Corps and its left flank to ensure the forces of other formations. In addition, since June 22, 1941, the troops of the 24th Tank Corps had not yet had a single day of rest and were in dire need of some break in combat operations to bring the material part into service. Not even half an hour after I managed to get the Army Group Command to agree to this, an order was received from the OK to descend one tank division in the direction of Gomel. The 24th Tank Corps was now ordered to advance southward toward Novozibkov and Starodub, having the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions in the 1st Echelon and the 10th Motorized Division in the 2nd Echelon, and after a successful breakthrough to turn a division to Gomel to operate on the right flank. On August 16, the 3rd Panzer Division seized the highway hub of the town of Miglin. On that day, Army Group Center was ordered to transfer the 39th Panzer Corps, consisting of the 12th Panzer Division, the 18th and 20th Motorized Divisions, to Army Group North. I do not concern myself here with those hesitations on the part of the command of Army Group Center, which were manifested in the following days during negotiations by telephone. On August 17, the right flank of the 24th Panzer Corps fell behind as a result of stubborn enemy resistance, while the 10th Motor Division and above all the 3rd Panzer Division of the Corps, operating on the left flank, successfully moved forward, capturing the junction station Anecker, thereby the railroad line Gomel. Bryansk was cut, and our troops deeply penetrated into the enemy's location. How could we better utilize the results of this breakthrough? It was assumed that the Second Army, relying on my right flank, would attack Gomel with its strong left flank. However, strangely enough, this did not happen. The main forces of the Second Army were advanced from its left flank to the northeast and moved far behind the offensive front of the 24th Tank Corps, which at that time was engaged in heavy fighting in the area of Starodob, Uneksha. I appealed to the headquarters of the Army Group with a request to instruct the Second Army to move its compounds first of all against the enemy operating on our right flank. I was promised that the headquarters would give such an order. But when I asked the headquarters of the Second Army whether it had received such an order, I was told that the offensive in the northeastern direction was undertaken by the Second Army on the orders of the headquarters of the Army Group. The expediency of decisive actions was caused by the fact that already on August 17 there was information about the withdrawal of the enemy from the area of Gomel. Already on that day, the 24th Tank Corps was ordered to block the enemy's way to the east in the areas of Anecker and Starodub. On August 19, the 1st Tank Group, part of Army Group South, captured a small bridgehead on the eastern bank of the Dnieper River near the city of Zaporozhye. The 2nd Army captured Gomel. The 24th Tank Corps, which was part of my tank group, was ordered to break through Klintsi and Starodub to Novozibkov and the 47th Tank Corps to provide the left flank of the 24th Tank Corps. At Poshep, the enemy offered stubborn resistance. August 18, Commander-in-Chief of the Army presented Hitler his thoughts on the further development of hostilities on the Eastern Front. August 20, 24th Tank Corps repulsed enemy attacks on the line Siraj, Klintzi, Starodub. Some units managed to break through to the east in the area south of Umeksha. Attacks on Yelnya were repulsed. On the same day field, Marshal von Bock ordered me by telephone to suspend further attack on Poshep, which was conducted by the left flank of the 2nd Panzer Group. He expressed the wish that all the troops of the tank group were concentrated to rest in the area of Roslavl in order to be able to undertake his proposed offensive on Moscow with fresh forces. Bok did not know the exact reason why the 2nd Army was not advancing. He was always in a hurry. On August 21, the 24th Panzer Corps captured Kostoboba. The 47th Panzer Corps seized Poshep. On August 22, the order was given to transfer the 20th, 9th and 7th Army Corps to the 4th Army. The command post of the 2nd Tank Group was moved to Shumyaki so that it would be closer to the divisions. At 19 o'clock, the same day I received a request from the Army Group headquarters about whether I could not transfer my tank formations, ready for action in the area of Klintsi, Pachip, on the left flank of the 2nd Army for an offensive in a southerly direction in cooperation with the 6th Army of Army Group South. It turned out that even earlier had received an order from the OK, or OKW, which ordered to allocate one of the motorized divisions to participate in the offensive conducted by the 2nd Army. I informed the Army Group headquarters that I considered the use of the tank group for action in this direction fundamentally wrong, 
and the fragmentation of it, directly a crime. On August 23, I was summoned to the headquarters of Army Group Center for a meeting, which was attended by the Chief of General Staff of the Army. He informed us that Hitler had decided to attack first of all not Leningrad and not Moscow, but the Ukraine and the Crimea. It was obvious to us that the Chief of General Staff, Colonel General Galder himself, deeply shocked that his plan to develop an offensive on Moscow failed. We conferred at length on the question of what could be done to make Hitler still change his final decision. We were all deeply convinced that Hitler's planned attack on Kiev would inevitably lead to a winter campaign with all its difficulties, which the OK wanted to avoid, having every reason to do so. I drew the attention of the participants of the meeting to the poor condition of the roads and difficulties in supply, which would be encountered by the armoured forces during the offensive to the south, and expressed my doubts as to whether the material part of the armoured units would be able to withstand these new tests, and after them the winter campaign, the offensive on Moscow. I further outlined to them the condition of the 24th Tank Corps, which since the beginning of the campaign in Russia has not yet had a single day of rest. All these arguments could be used by the Chief of General Staff to try once again to influence Hitler to change his mind. Field Marshal von Bock also understood me well, and after some reflection made a proposal that I went with Colonel General Galder to the Führer's headquarters, and as a frontline general to report directly to Hitler our views on the further development of operations. Von Bock's proposal was accepted. We flew to the headquarters, and by evening landed at the airfield Letzen in East Prussia. I immediately went to the commander-in-chief of the land forces. Von Marshal von Brauchitsch met me with the following words. I forbid you to raise before the Fuhrer the question of an attack on Moscow. There is an order to attack in the southern direction, and the question can only be about how to fulfill it. Further discussion of the question is useless. In response to this, I asked permission to fly back to his tank group, for under such conditions it makes no sense to enter into any explanations with Hitler. However, Field Marshal von Brachich did not agree to this. He ordered me to go to Hitler and report to him the position of his tank group, without, however, mentioning anything about Moscow. I went to Hitler and in the presence of a large circle of persons. Kittil, Jodl, Schmantand and others reported the situation on the front in front of my tank group, the position of the group itself, as well as the nature of the terrain. Unfortunately, at my report was not Brochitz or, or any other representative of the OK. After I had finished my report, Hitler asked me the following question. Do you consider your troops capable of making another major effort at their present fighting capacity? I replied, if the troops have a real objective in front of them, which will be understood by every soldier. Yes. Hitler. You mean Moscow, of course? I replied. Yes. Since you have broached the subject, permit me to state my views on the... Hitler gave his permission, and I gave him a detailed and convincing presentation of all the arguments, speaking in favour of continuing the offensive on Moscow rather than Kiev. I expressed to him my opinion that from the military point of view now, it is a matter of completely destroying the enemy's armed forces, which in recent battles have suffered significant losses. I outlined to him the geographical position of the capital of Russia, which is very different from other capitals, such as Paris, and is the centre of communication and communications, the political and most important industrial centre of the country. The capture of Moscow would have a very great effect on the morale of the Russian people, as well as on the whole world. I drew his attention to the fact that the troops were determined to advance on Moscow and that all preparations in that direction were being met with great enthusiasm. I tried to explain to Hitler that after achieving military success in the decisive direction and the defeat of the main enemy forces will be much easier to seize the economically important areas of the Ukraine as the capture of Moscow. The hub of the most important road will make it extremely difficult for the Russians to move their troops from north to south. I also reminded him that the troops of Army Group Center are already in full combat readiness to go on the offensive to Moscow, while the proposed offensive to Kiev is associated with the need to transfer troops to the southwest, which will take a lot of time, and in the subsequent offensive to Moscow, tank troops will have to pass again the same distance, I from Roslavl to Lukvitsa, equal to 450 km, which will cause repeated wear and tear of material and fatigue of personnel. On the experience of the movement of our troops in the direction of Anecha, I outlined to him the condition of the roads in the area indicated to me for the transfer of my troops 
and drew his attention to the difficulties in organizing supplies, which must inevitably increase every day if we are turned to the Ukraine. Finally, I pointed out the dire consequences which should arise if operations in the South were to be delayed, especially by bad weather. It would then be too late to strike a decisive blow to the enemy in the direction of Moscow this year. In conclusion, I asked Hitler to push back all other considerations, subordinating them primarily to the solution of the main task, the achievement of decisive military success. All other tasks would thereby be solved subsequently. Hitler gave me the opportunity to speak without interrupting me once. He then took the floor to give us a detailed account of his considerations as to why exactly he had come to a different decision. He emphasized that the raw materials and food of the Ukraine were vital to the continuation of the war. In this connection, he mentioned the need to take possession of Crimea, which was the aircraft carrier of the Soviet Union, in its struggle against Romanian oil. It was the first time I heard him say, my generals understand nothing about military economics. Hitler ended his speech with a strict order to immediately go on the offensive against Kiev, which is his immediate strategic goal. At the same time, for the first time I had to experience something that later had to meet quite often. After each phrase of Hitler, all present silently nodded their heads in agreement with him, and I was left with my opinion in the singular. Obviously, he had already made such speeches more than once to justify his more than strange decisions. I regretted very much that at the time of this report, on which depended very much, perhaps even the outcome of the war, were not present neither Field Marshal von Brasic nor Colonel General Holder. In view of the fact that I was opposed by a united front of the entire OKU, I decided that day to stop further struggle, because then I still believed that I could get a meeting with the head of state face to face and prove to him the rightness of his views. After the decision to go on the offensive in the Ukraine was once again confirmed, there was nothing left for me to do but to fulfill it in the best possible way. Therefore, I appealed to Hitler with a request to abandon the previously proposed fragmentation of my tank group and ordered to send the entire group to perform a new task in order to achieve rapid success before the onset of autumn, because the autumn rains make this roadless country impassable and the movement of tank formations will be paralyzed. I was promised that my request would be granted. It was well past midnight when I returned to my apartment. On the same day, August 23, the OK gave Army Group Center an order to destroy the large forces of the 5th Army of the Russians and to assist Army Group South, facilitating its early passage across the Dnieper. For this purpose, it is necessary to create a strike group, if possible under the command of Colonel General Guderian, which with its right flank should strike in the direction of Chernigov, about this order, I was not aware of anything that day when I reported to Hitler. Colonel General Halder also did nothing to somehow inform me of this order during the day of August 23. On the morning of August 24, I went to the Chief of the General's Staff and reported to him that my attempts to change Hitler's mind had failed. I was sure that not very much surprised Golder with my message, but was extremely surprised when this message caused him a nervous outburst and he attacked me with a number of completely unfounded accusations. Only a heightened nervous state of Holder can explain his conversation on the phone about me with the command of Army Group Center, as well as completely incorrect statements of officers of the headquarters of the group appeared in their post-war articles. Especially Golder was irritated by my desire to undertake a new operation from the very beginning with large forces. He did not understand these aspirations of mine and subsequently tried to counteract it. We parted without reaching an understanding. I flew back to my tank group, having received orders to go on August 25 to Ukraine. August 24, 24th Tank Corps captured Novozivkov. The enemy was thrown back to the line Anekka, Steridob. Hitler's order of August 21, which served as a starting point for the upcoming operations, basically. The OK proposal of August 18 on the development of operations in the direction of Moscow does not correspond to my plans. I... I to consider the most important goal before the onset of winter is not the capture of Moscow, but the capture of the Crimea, the industrial and coal region of the Donbass and deprive the Russians of access to the Caucasian oil. In the north, the most important goal is to consider the blockade of Leningrad and connection with the Finns. Exceptionally favorable operational situation, which has developed due to our achievement of the line gomol Pachyap, should be used in order to immediately undertake an operation which should be carried out by the adjacent flanks of Army Groups South and Centre. 
The purpose of this operation should not be a simple displacement of the Fifth Army of the Russian behind the Dnieper line only by the forces of our Sixth Army, and the complete destruction of the enemy before it reaches the line of the Desna River, Konotop, Suda River. This will enable Army Group South to occupy a bridgehead on the east bank of the Dnieper River in the Middle Reaches, and its left flank in cooperation with Army Group Center to develop an offensive on Rostov, Kharkiv. Army Group Center should, without regard to further plans, to allocate for the implementation of this operation as many forces as necessary to destroy the Fifth Army of the Russians, leaving themselves a small force necessary to repel enemy attacks on the central section of the front. Take possession of the Crimean Peninsula, which is of paramount importance for our unimpeded export of oil from Romania. This order, the exact text of which was not yet known to me at the time of my report on August 23, served as the basis for those instructions that were given to my tank group by the OK and the command of Army Group Center. The most bitter disappointment caused me the withdrawal of the 46th Tank Corps from my tank group. Despite the promise given to me by Hitler, the Army Group Command decided to leave this corps in reserve of the 4th Army, concentrating it in the area of Roslavl and Smolensk. I had to go out to new campaign, having only two corps, the 24th and 47th, the forces of which from the beginning were recognized by me as insufficient. My protest against this decision was left unheeded by the command of the army group. I was given Konotop as the initial target of the offensive. All other instructions regarding the establishment of interaction with the group south remained in force. Given the grouping of forces of my tank group at that time, I had nothing else to do but to set the task before the 24th Tank Corps, which was already in the area of Aneka, to break through the Russian front again, and at the same time to ensure our right flank from the threat of the enemy retreating from the area of Gomel to the east. The 47th Tank Corps was tasked with the forces of the 17th Tank Division, the only division which the corps had the opportunity to immediately enter into battle, to ensure the left flank of the tank group through the transition to the east. The Sudost River itself did not present any serious obstacle in the dry season. The 29th Motor Division already at this time occupied along the Desna River and the upper reaches of the Sudost River defence of Atikem. East of Staradub, the enemy was still located on the western bank of the Sudost River on the flank of the 24th Tank Corps. After the 29th Motorized Division was replaced by an infantry division, the length of our flank from Pokep to the original target of the offensive, Konotop amounted to 180 km. Only from here began the main operation, therefore the main threat. This information about the enemy forces on the left flank was extremely sketchy. In any case, it should have been considered that the forces of the 47th Tank Corps will be fully occupied with the task of ensuring our flank. The combat effectiveness of the 24th Panzer Corps, intended to act as a strike force, was greatly weakened by the fact that it had to begin a new task without having had time to rest and replenish after participating in extremely heavy fighting and making a tiring march. The position of the tank route on August 25 was as follows. 10th Motorized Division passed through Holmy and Evdibolka, 3rd Tank Division, through Kostobob and Novohorod Seversky. 4th Tank Division was tasked to clear the western bank of the Sudost River from the enemy and replaced by units of the 47th Tank Corps to move behind the 3rd Tank Division. 7th Panzer Corps. 17th Panzer Division was tasked to cross at Pushep to the left bank of the Sudost River and advance in the direction of Trubshevs, then cross to the left bank of the Desna River and advance along the river to the southwest with the task of assisting the 24th Panzer Corps in forcing the Desna River. All the other forces of the Corps had only just left that day from the area of Roslovel. Early in the morning of August 25, I went to the 17th Panzer Division to be present at the forcing of the Sudost River and the Rogue River flowing southward. The troops were moving on bad sandy roads, experiencing considerable difficulties. Many vehicles were out of service. Already at 12 hours. 30 min. I had to request from Emglien replenishment of the commander's tanks, cars and motorcycles. This boded us far from happy prospects in the future. At 14 hours. 30 minutes, I arrived at the command post of the 17th Panzer Division, located 5 kilometers north of Poshep. In my opinion, the forces allocated to carry out this difficult offensive were, in view of their small numbers, insufficient. Therefore, compared to the 24th Tank Corps, 
the 17th Panzer Division was moving too slowly. This circumstance I pointed out to the division commander, General von Tom, and the corps commander who arrived here. In order to familiarize myself with the situation of the enemy, I went to the 63rd Motorized Rifle Regiment, which was advancing in the first echelon and for some time advanced with him. I spent the night in Poshep. On the morning of August 26, I went with my adjutant major bussing to the forward artillery observation post located on the north bank of the Rogue River to observe the results of our dive bomber raids on the Russian defensive positions on the opposite bank of the river. The bombs laid down accurately, but inflicted minimal damage. Still, the moral impact of the bombing on the Russians, as a result of which they were driven into their trenches, gave us the opportunity to force the river almost without losses, because of the careless behaviour of one of our officers. The Russian observers noticed us and opened an accurate mortar fire. A mine that exploded in the immediate vicinity of our observation post wounded five officers, including Major Bussing, who was sitting next to me. I remained unharmed only by a miracle. Against us were defending the 269th and 282nd divisions of the Russians. After the crossing of the Rogue River was made in my presence and the bridge was built, in the afternoon I went through M. Glynn to Anicha, where the command post of the tank group was transferred. On the way I received a joyful and completely unexpected report that the energetic actions of the tank unit of Oberlusen and Butchterkirch made it possible for the 3rd Panzer Division to capture unharmed a bridge 700 metres long on the Desna River east of novgorod siversky This happy accident greatly facilitated our operations at that time. Only by midnight I reached my new command post. Here I found arrived from the OKO Bequarter Tarmister a General Paulus and several officers from the operational department of the General Staff. Okiered in the afternoon at the command post to familiarise themselves with the situation. No rights to give orders Paulus did not have. During my absence Paulus talked about the situation with Lieutenant Colonel Baron von Liebenstein and then contacted the OK and made a proposal to unite under a single command of the left flank corps of the Second Army Tank Group and the 1st Cavalry Division acting on the left flank of this group. Paulus was cryptically answered that the resubordination of the 2nd Army's compounds was out of the question at this time, and that the movement of the 2nd Army was of only tactical importance. The 1st Cavalry Division remained as part of the 2nd Army, which shifted its main blow to the right flank. However, the enemy located on the Desna was too strong, and it could not simply be left in the depths of our left flank, as the OK apparently assumed. It was necessary to first defeat this enemy in order to be able to move further south. The next day I again talked with Paulus, giving him all my thoughts. Paulus exactly transferred them to the chief of the general staff, but with the prevailing their hostile attitude to me, they made no impression. By the evening of August 26, the left flank of the second army was south of Novozivkov. The dividing line between the tank group and the left flank of the second army passed from Klintsi through the hills to Salsnitsa. The dividing line with the 4th Army passed from Surash through Aneka, Poshep, Brazovo. The 10th Motorized Division of the 24th Tank Corps was in the area of Komi, Avdivka. The 3rd Tank Division concentrated to the bridge across the Desna south of novgorod siversky The 4th Tank Division was fighting with the enemy southeast of Starodub. The 17th Tank Division of the 47th Tank Corps fought in the area of Semsi south of Poshep. The 29th Motorized Division provided the left flank of the tank group in the area of Poshep, Zhukovka. After the approach of infantry divisions of the 12th and 53rd Army, Corps, the 29th Motorized Division concentrated its forces on the right flank. The 18th Panzer Division followed its advanced units from the north through Roslal. Simultaneously with the movement of the tank group, from north to south there was an advance of other formations from west to east. 167th Infantry Division moved through Emglin, 31st Infantry Division, north of Maglin, 34th Infantry Division, the through Kletnia, 52nd Infantry Division, near through Perelese, 267th and 252nd Infantry Divisions moved along the road Krishev, Cherikov, Propivoysk. All these divisions were part of the 2nd Army. If at least one part of these divisions had turned south at the very beginning of the Kiev Offensive, it would have been possible to avoid the repeated crises on the right flank of the 24th Tank Corps. On August 26, the resistance of the enemy operating on the Desna River in front of the troops of the 2nd Army intensified. 
In order to achieve rapid success, I asked to transfer to this area of the 47th Tank Corps. However, my request was rejected by the Oak. On August 29, large enemy forces, supported by aircraft, launched an offensive from the south and west against the 24th Tank Corps. The course was forced to suspend the offensive of the 3rd Armored Division and the 10th Motorized Division. The 4th Armored Division, having accomplished its task of clearing the western bank of the Sudast River from the enemy, was pulled up to the 3rd Armored Division in the novgorod siversky area. After personally familiarizing myself with the situation in front of the front of the 24th Tank Corps, and in the 3rd and 4th Tank Divisions, I decided to give the 24th Tank Corps the task for August 30. To eliminate the threat to our flank on the right, and on August the... Hmm. To continue the offensive in a southwest direction. The 47th Tank Corps. To advance along the eastern bank of the Sudos River, and then continue the offensive along the Desna River to Novgorod Siversky. At 18 hours, I flew back to my command post. On this trip, for the last time, I was accompanied by the head of the operational department of the tank group, Lieutenant Colonel Baya Lee. He was transferred to Africa, and Major Wolf was assigned in his place. By August 31, the bridgehead on the Desna River was greatly expanded. The 4th Panzer Division crossed the Desna, the 10th Motorized Division reached a point north of Korop, but as a result of a rapid counterattack of the Russians was thrown back to the opposite bank. Large enemy forces were also advancing on its right flank. By bringing into the battle the last forces, the personnel of the Bakery Company, with great difficulty avoided disaster on the right flank. In the 47th Panzer Corps Band of Action, the Russians were advancing from the area of Trubchevsk to the west and northwest by the 108th Panzer Brigade, and from September 1 also by the 110th Panzer Brigade, strongly displacing the stubbornly held units of the 17th Panzer Division, the 29th Motorized Division crossed the bridge at Novgorod Siverskoto, and then advanced northward to secure the northern flank of the bridgehead established by the 24th Panzer Corps, as well as to facilitate the advance of the 17th Panzer Division, the 18th Panzer Division replaced the 4th Panzer Division in the southeastern section in the area between the confluence of the Sudost River and the Desna River, Sudost in Desna and Pochep. In view of the enemy's offensive against my both flanks and his active actions in front of the front, especially against the 10th Motorized Division, it seemed to me doubtful whether it was possible to continue the offensive with the available forces. Therefore, I again appeal to the Command of Army Group Center with a request to place the 46th Panzer Corps at my disposal. At my disposal on August 30 were sent only Infantry Regiment Great Germany, September 1, the 1st Cavalry Division and September 2 SS Division Reich, from the area of Smolensk. A breakthrough up to 10 kilometers deep made by the Russians on the 23rd Infantry Division south of Yelnya necessitated the use of the 10th Panzer Division to launch a frontal counterattack here. The Great Germany Infantry Regiment was sent to the novhorod siversky area, while the SS Reich Division was moved to the right flank of the 24th Panzer Corps. On September 2, the Regiment Great Germany arrived in the area of the bridgehead near novhorod siversky SS's Division Reich arrived on the right flank of the 24th Tank Corps on September 3. The fact that the necessary forces were provided to me only in drops forced me on September 1 to send a radiogram to the command of the Army Group, in which I asked to place at my disposal the entire 4B Tank Corps, and, in addition, to transfer to me the 7th and 11th Panzer Divisions and the 14th Motorized Division, which, as I knew, at that time did not participate in the fighting. I expressed the opinion that only with such large forces could the operation for the capture of Kiev be completed quickly. As a direct result of this radiogram, the SS Reich Division was placed at my disposal. However, the content of my radiogram was overheard by the control post of the OK and then became known in the highest circles. This was evidenced by the behavior of the OK liaison officer Lieutenant Colonel Nagel. The content of my radiogram was reported to Hitler and the OK carried out on this occasion a number of very deplorable measures for me. All this will be described below. On September 2, Field Marshal Kasselring, Commander of the Air Fleet came to the headquarters of the tank group for negotiations. He informed us that Army Group South, as if moved forward, and it captured some bridgeheads on the Dnieper. As for the direction of further development of the operation, it is still unclear whether to attack Kharkov or...
On this day, General's model and von Toma were lightly wounded. On September 3, I drove past the rear units of the 10th Motor Division and the bakery company involved in the battle to the motorized units of the SS Division Reich, which were in the area of Abdeidecker. West of this locality was the enemy, against which the reconnaissance battalion of the SS Division was advancing. At first there was disorder on this section of the front which, however, was quickly eliminated thanks to the clear leadership of General Gasser. I met him in Avevka and gave him the task of being ready to launch an offensive on Sosnitsa on September 4. The 5th Machine Gun Battalion, which had recently arrived from Roslavol, I put under his command. In the afternoon I visited the 10th Motorized Division, which during the last days had to participate in heavy fighting and suffered heavy losses. After the crossing to the south bank of the Desna River by the 4th Panzer Division, the situation of the 10th Motorized Division improved somewhat. The Russians were particularly active against the units preparing to cross the Desna. Against the 10th Motorized Division acted the 10th Tank Brigade of the Russians and 293rd, 24th, 143rd and 42nd Infantry Divisions, which had a large numerical advantage. I familiarized the division commander, General Lepper, with the situation and with the task of the neighboring SS Division Reich, setting him the task to ensure the next day his right flank of the actions of the SS Division. I then went to the area of the bridgehead on the south bank of the Desna River, held by the 2nd Battalion of the 20th Infantry Regiment, whose personnel made a good impression on me. Finally, I also visited the 1st Battalion of the same regiment, which had failed a few days before, but had time to quickly correct its mistake. This battalion also made an excellent impression on me, and I expressed my confidence that in the future it would also perform its tasks perfectly. From my headquarters I received word by radio that the 1st Cavalry Division had again been placed under my command and was approaching the right flank of the SS Reach Division. I then went again to the commander of the SS Division, ordering him to ensure his units to organize the supply of the 10th Motor Division and then return to my command post. There I learned that Borsner and Conatop, located on the direction of our strike, remain the nearest target of the offensive. The headquarters and half of the compounds of the 46th Panzer Corps were again transferred to the subordination of the tank group. Both corps reported that each had captured 2,500 prisoners. General of Engineers Becker's compound, established to guard the rear, captured 1,200 prisoners. The 24th Panzer Corps pressed on, calling attention to the ever-increasing threat to our southern flank, which was growing longer, and to the ever-increasing weakening of the point of our wedge. Our troops had captured the town of Krolibets. On this day, Lieutenant Colonel Nagel, the communications officer of the Army Main Command, took part in a meeting held at the Army Group headquarters in Borisov, which was attended by the Army Commander. Nagel reported my assessment of the situation, for this, he was labelled a loudmouth and propagandist and immediately removed from his position. I regretted very much that this able officer, who also had an excellent knowledge of the Russian language, was punished for having, in the performance of his official duty, accurately reported to the command the views that prevailed at the front. This was not the end of the trouble. In the evening it rained heavily, which soon made the roads impossible. Two-thirds of the units of the SS Division Reich, which was on the march, were stuck on the road. I spent September 4 at the front of the 4th Panzer Division, where I met General von Geyer. On the 75 km return trip I spent 4.5 hours, so spoiled the roads due to short-term rain. The 4th Panzer Division intended to advance in the direction of Korop, Krasnopoli. The enemy operating against this division had so far defended very stubbornly, including against our tanks. However, as a result of the actions of dive bombers, the enemy resistance was largely broken. General von Geyer, having studied the captured documents, found that the greatest success could be achieved by continuing the offensive in the direction of Sosnitsa, as here was the junction between the 13th and 21st armies of the Russians. It was quite possible that the Russians had a gap in this section of the front at all, the 3rd Panzer Division reporting a successful advance. I went to this division and met its units which were advancing through Mutino and Sparskoi to the Seine River. General Model also had the impression that there was a very weak enemy defence, or even some gap in the enemy's defences in front of him. I ordered Model after crossing the river, same to advance in the direction of the railroad line Conatop, Bellapodier, and cut it. On the way back I transmitted by Drate and radio to my headquarters on the actions for the next day. I had a premonition that Hitler might interfere in the combat operations of the tank.
Her telephonogram received from Army Group Headquarters reported that the High Command of the Armed Forces was dissatisfied with the actions of the tank group, especially the actions of the 47th Tank Corps on the east bank of the Desna River. I was required to present my assessment of the situation and plans for the future. During the night, the order of the Army General Command arrived to stop the offensive of the 47th Tank Corps and to transfer the corps to the western bank of the river. The order was transmitted to me in a very sharp form, which greatly hurt me. On the 47th Tank Corps, this order had an overwhelming effect. Corps and division headquarters were confident in the success of the upcoming operation, the withdrawal of the corps and its reintroduction into the battle on the opposite bank of the Desna River required more time than the implementation of the previously planned offensive. On September 5, the 1st Cavalry Division was transferred to Pogar and transferred to the 4th Army. We preferred to keep it as a mobile reserve on our left flank to provide the flank of the 47th Tank Corps. Now its manoeuvring capabilities were not used due to the fact that the division received a permanent task to provide the flank on the section of the River Sudost. On this day, the SS Division Reich took possession of Sosnitsa. The 4th Army was ordered to abandon the Yaninskaya Ark as it had suffered heavy losses there, which I wanted to avoid in August by timely withdrawal. On September 6, I again visited the SS Reich Division. On that day the division was attacking the railroad bridge over the Desna near Makoshino. I ordered to give the division the necessary air support. Because of the poor condition of the roads, the division was not yet fully assembled. On the way I met some units of the division that were on the march, other units were resting in the forest. The division personnel made an excellent impression with their discipline and expressed their joy that the division would once again be operating as part of a tank group. In the afternoon, the bridge was captured and we thus secured another crossing of Desna. I and the vehicles accompanying me repeatedly had to move under enemy artillery fire, but we suffered no losses. On the way back I met units of the 1st Cavalry Division which were on foot because of the poor condition of the roads and units of the SS Division. Driving at the Division Command Post, I ordered to expand the bridgehead on the Desna River to prepare an offensive along the western bank of the Siem River, assisting the 24th Tank Corps advancing on this section of the front. On September 7, 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions managed to capture bridgeheads on the southern bank of the Seam River. On that day, the Army Group Headquarters gave the order to advance to the line of Nishin, Monastai Rishé, and to strike the main blow in the direction of Nishin. In the morning of September 8 at 5 o'clock, 25 mine, this order was cancelled, and I received the following instruction. The new direction, Bosna, Romney, the main blow, on this day, the Commander-in-Chief of the Ground Forces talked to me at the headquarters of the 2nd Army in Gomel about the new operation planned in the direction of Moscow, which was scheduled for early October. In addition, Field Marshal von Brochitschek again talked with me about the actions of the 47th Tank Corps in the direction of Trubchevsk, expressed dissatisfaction with my radiogram of September 1, which contained a request for reinforcements which he could hear about in the High Command of the Armed Forces. He expressed his opinion that the tank group had expanded its combat operations without any necessity. I justified that I could not leave unattended the large enemy forces on his left flank and believed that these forces must be destroyed. The second army captured on this day Chernigov. It was ordered to strike the main blow in the direction of Nizhyn. On this day Lieutenant Colonel Nagel left us. His position was taken by Major Calden. He performed his tasks with the same tact and understanding of the case as Nagel and Belov had done before him. The 4th Tank Group and the 18th Army, part of Army Group North, took the initial positions for the offensive on the outer defensive ring of Leningrad. The beginning of the offensive was scheduled for September 9. On September 9, the 24th Tank Corps crossed the Siem River. On that day I was with the 4th Tank Division and watched the actions of units of the 33rd and 12th Motorized Rifle Regiments advancing on Gorodish. Dive bombers provided effective support to the forward units, Motorized Regiments and the 35th Tank Regiment. The small number of all units and formations strongly showed that the troops, after intense and bloody fighting, which lasted continuously for 2.5 months, need rest and restaffing. Unfortunately, this was out of the question. By the end of the day, the commander of the 24th Panzer Corps, General Van Gaia, reported to me that the SS Division had also gone on the offensive, and that the 3rd Panzer Division intended to advance in the direction of Konotop. 
According to the testimony of prisoners, the 40th Army was positioned between the Russian 13th and 21st Armies. The situation with ammunition was still bearable, the situation with fuel. In the evening by airplane I returned to my command post in Krolovets. At this time from the headquarters of the Army Group reported that the 1st Cavalry Division will not be left in the area of the River Sudost and will be transferred further north. 18th Panzer Division therefore could not move to follow the tank group. Fresh forces would be needed to develop the success on the Seam River. In the evening was received a happy report that the 24th Panzer Corps really found in the area of Baturin, Kainotop weak spot in the enemy's defence, and that the advanced detachment of the 3rd Panzer Division is moving to the city of Romani, which was the goal of our offensive. Thus the division went to the rear of the enemy. It would have been necessary to quickly develop the success of the division, but with a lack of forces, poor condition of roads, and most importantly, with the stretching of our southeastern flank, which has already reached 240 kilometers, this task was not easy. In view of the lack of reserves, I had nothing else to do but to go myself to the area of action of the 3rd Panzer Division and decide on the spot how to proceed. Therefore, I decided to go to the front line again on September 10. When I entered Zindovka, General von Gaia reported to me that the 3rd Panzer Division had captured the town of Romney and created a bridgehead on the Romney River. 3rd Panzer Division approached the city of Romney, bypassing Konotop. The 4th Panzer Division advanced to Bukmak, says Division Reich, to Bosna. According to the testimony of prisoners, the Russian units operating in Ukraine were still able to defend themselves, but their offensive impulse was broken. General von Gaia, I ordered as soon as possible to seize the important railroad station Konotop, through which the supply and resupply will be delivered, the 4th Armored Division to advance from Bukmark to the south, and the SS Division Reich, from Bosna to Kostopsi. The SS Division was assigned the task of keeping in touch with the 2nd Army. I then continued my trip to the 3rd Panzer Division. When crossing the bridge over the Siem River, we were bombed by Russian aviation, the road was shelled by enemy artillery. Because of the rain, the road was getting worse all the time. Along the road, there were a lot of stranded vehicles. Columns stretched out a lot. Tractors of artillery units had to drag trucks behind them. In Kemelev, where the headquarters of the 3rd Panzer Division was located, I ordered to prepare an apartment for me for the night, since returning the same day was out of the question. Then I went to Romney. North of the town the R. Romney was a good natural frontier, which in addition was reinforced by wire barriers and an anti-tank ditch. That the Russians were not able to hold this strong boundary was evidenced by the fact that the appearance of the 3rd Panzer Division was a complete surprise to them, and that the breakthrough was realized by this strike alone. Near the town of Romney I met General Model, who reported to me some details of the situation. The town was in his hands, but separate groups of the enemy were still wandering in the city gardens and passage was possible only in an armoured car. At 17 o'clock, should have begun to clear the city of the remnants of the enemy. In the northern part of the city I came across a group of senior officers receiving orders from Colonel Kleeman. The group suffered heavy losses in an enemy air raid, against which it was impossible to organise the necessary cover, as the Russian aviation operated from airfields located in the zone of good weather, while our airfields were in the zone of unfavourable weather, and on this rainy day our planes had no opportunity to take to the air. We were also bombarded with machine gun fire from three Russian airplanes that had dropped their bombs elsewhere. From the town of Romney I radioed my headquarters with instructions for the next day, ordering the incoming 46th Tank Corps and its subordinate 17th Armoured Division and the Great Germania Infantry Regiment to advance in the direction of Puteville, Shilovka. For model, I requested strong cover by fighter planes. On this day was captured Bakhmuch. Regiment Great Germany reached Puteville. Army Group Headquarters ordered us to prepare for an offensive on the boundary of the Uday River, near the town of Priluki. Army Group South was preparing to force the Dnieper near Kremenjug, from where it should turn north to join us near the town of Romney. All night it was pouring heavy rain, so the return trip on September 11 was extremely difficult. First the motorcycles were out of order. Then my excellent all-terrain vehicle got stuck. The stuck vehicles were pulled out by my commander's tank and a tractor provided to us by the artillery unit. Moving along the muddy road at a speed of 10 kilometers per hour, I reached the point of Girevka, 
where the regimental headquarters was located, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Order. Telephone communication was broken, and I could not get the necessary information about the situation. Finally, a motorcycle unit of the 3rd Panzer Division reported that Konotop was in our hands. Six chem north of Gurevka, I came across a reconnaissance battalion of the 10th Motorized Division. At 14 o'clock, I met General von Leper in Konotop, familiarized him with the situation in the Romney area, and at 15, 30 min, I arrived at the 24th Tank Corps. There I was informed that the SS Division Reich occupied by the Corps was tasked to move in the direction to Romney. The 46th Tank Corps was tasked to move southward through Putival. At 18 hours, 30 min, I returned to my command post. On September 10, in 10 hours, I traveled 165 km, and on September 11 for 10.5 hours. 130 kilometers, the poor condition of the roads made it impossible to travel at a greater speed. These long journeys gave me a full idea of the difficulties we would have to meet in the future. Only those who had traveled along these muddy and muddy roads to the front positions could imagine the strain that the troops and the material part were under, could really correctly assess the situation at the front and make the necessary conclusions. As a result of the fact that the higher military command did not collect any material regarding the experience gained and at first did not believe our reports at all, we had to experience many difficulties and suffer unprecedented sacrifices, which in most cases could have been avoided. Army Group Headquarters informed us in the evening that due to the poor condition of the roads, the first tank group of Colonel General Kleist did not reach on that day the goal set for it. Those who knew the condition of the roads as described above were not at all surprised by this order. We were ordered to continue the offensive in a southerly direction. September 10. The 17th Panzer Division reached the line Voronezh, Glukhov, and September 11 took the town of Glukhov. On September 12, the 1st Tank Group began to advance through Semyonovka to Lyubny. The 3rd Tank Division was on the offensive at Lokbitsa, capturing north of this point a bridge over the River Suda. The 2nd Army, because of the poor condition of the roads, slowly advanced to Nishi. Army Group North was confident that in the near future the Leningrad Defense Front would be broken through. On September 13, Army Group Center rejected our proposal to replace with infantry units of the 18th Panzer Division, still providing in the southeast of our lagging and too stretched left flank, reasoning their refusal by the fact that the division will still not be able to come up in time to ensure the achievement of a decisive success. Our indications of the unclear situation on our right flank, the possible threat in this area, and the consequent need for at least a small reserve were also ignored. The first tank group occupied Lubny. On September 14, the command post of my tank group moved to Konotop. The weather continued to be bad. Aerial reconnaissance was completely ineffective. Ground reconnaissance units were stuck in the mud. Units of the 46th and 47th Tank Corps, allocated to support our flanks, remained almost immobile. The insecurity of our stretched left flank increased every day. In order to ensure at all costs to establish communication with Kleist's tank group, I decided, despite all the difficulties, to go to the 24th Tank Corps. The road went through Krelevets, Baturin, Konatop, Romney to Lukvitsa. General von Geyer, whom I met in Michenki, reported to me that the enemy is accumulating in the area of Lukvitsa, and therefore it is necessary to close the gap between us and Kleist. Accordingly, he ordered his divisions to advance to the boundary of the River Sula, at Sencha, 11 kilometers south of Lovitz, large concentrations of Russians were noted. I continued my trip and entered the town of Romney, through the streets of which festively dressed crowds of locals were peacefully walking. After Poshep and Konotop, Romney was the most well-appointed Russian town I had so far visited. At nightfall, I was already in Lokvitsa at Models. By this time, he had succeeded in bringing up only one regiment from his division. The rest of the division, owing to the bad condition of the roads, was still far away. The model reported to me that the large concentrations of the Russians consisted mainly of rear units. Only some units had sufficient combat equipment. The tanks available to the Russians were apparently assembled in rear workshops and had the task of covering the retreat. In a huge cauldron in the Kiev area, apparently remained parts of five Russian armies, 21, 5, 37, 26 and 38. The enemy's attacks on our southeastern flank south of Putival and at Yampol were repulsed. 
I spent the night with Busing and Colden in the school building in Lukwitze. By radio, I instructed Liebenstein to speed up the transfer of the 10th Motorized Division to Romney in order to free the units of the 5th Panzer Division, which were there to be transferred to Lukwitze. The school was in a sturdy building and was well equipped, as were all the schools in Soviet Russia, which were almost everywhere in good condition. Much had been done for schools, hospitals, orphanages and sports grounds in Russia. These institutions were kept clean and in good order. Early in the morning of September 15, I visited an advanced detachment of the 3rd Armoured Division, commanded by Major Frank. This detachment had the previous day driven the Russians westward in the vicinity of Lukvitsa, and during the night had captured enemy infantry following in 15 vehicles. From Major Frank's observation post near Lubna, the terrain was very well screened, and it was possible to observe the movement of the Russian transport columns from west to east. However, this movement was soon suspended by us. In the 2nd Battalion of the 3rd Motorized Rifle Regiment, I met Modet, who reported to me his plan of further action. Finally, I visited a number of units of the 3rd Armoured Division and spoke with the commander of the 6th Armoured Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Muenzel. On this day, Munzel had at his disposal only one TIV tank, three TII tanks and six TIE tanks. Thus, the regiment had only ten tanks. This figure gives the clearest indication of how much the troops needed rest and tidying up. These figures also show that our brave soldiers were doing everything in their power in order to fulfill the task assigned to them. By radio, I instructed Liebenstein to order the 24th Panzer Corps to move the SS Division right in a southerly direction to the boundary of the Udai River between the settlements of Kostovsi and Perevoloknoye and the 4th Panzer Division. On the boundary Srebnoye, Berezovka. 10th Motorized Division to move in the direction of Glinsk southwest of Romney. Then I flew back to the headquarters of my tank group on the airplane Storch. The 17th Panzer Division came this day on Putivol. In the evening I met in Konotop with Liebenstein, who by then had time to fly to the headquarters of the army group to receive instructions on the preparation for the new task, the offensive on Moscow. The new operation was intended to destroy the last combat-ready forces of Timoshenko's group. Three quarters of the entire German army was intended to fulfill this task. Liebenstein's repeated request to release our 18th Panzer Division was rejected by Field Marshal von Bock, reasoning that when asked what was more important, fighting in the south or preparing for a new offensive, Colonel General Galder replied, the latter is more important. On September 16, we moved our forward command post to Romney. The encirclement of the Russian troops continued successfully. We joined up with Kleist's tank group, SS Division Reich, occupied Preluki, the Second Army was withdrawn from our front to fulfill a new task. In the town of Romney before the Battle of Poltar, in December 1708, for several days was the headquarters of the Swedish King Charles XP. On September 17, I visited the 4th Armoured Division located in Srebnoy. Since there was not yet a strong connection between this division and the SS Reich Division located to the right, I decided to go to the Reich Division. The road went through no man's land. In the forest on both sides of the road, there were still fresh traces of Russian camps. At Perivolochnoi, I noticed the barrels of two guns pointed directly at us. We had to endure several very unpleasant minutes before we were able to ascertain that the crews of these guns had escaped and the harnesses had been left near the nearest haystack. In the centre of the village of Perivolochnoi, I observed a motorcycle unit of the SS Division fighting over a crossing of the Uday River. From here I went to Kustovsi, also located on this river, where other units of the SS Division were fighting. Colonel Bittrich reported to me on the progress of the fighting. Then I went back and after driving about 100 kilometres through no man's land, I returned via Ivanica Jaroshevka to Romney. The road was exceptionally bad, and only by morning did I arrive at my command post. On September 17, we agreed with Kleist's tank group to replace the 3rd Panzer Division with the 25th Motorized Division so that this tank division could finally put its material in order. On this day, the Russians tried to attack our eastern flank. The 10th Motorized Division and the Great Germania Regiment had to endure fierce fighting in the Konotop area. The enemy increased its activity in the area of our bridgehead on the Desna River. The Russian railroad lines running from the east to Kiev were destroyed in many places by our bomber aircraft. However, the Russians showed their ability to quickly restore them, 
and we had to reckon with the possibility of fresh enemy forces on our overstretched flank. After the occupation of Detskoy Selo, formerly called Tarskoy Selo, the attack of Army Group North on Leningrad was suspended. The bulk of the tank divisions operating on this front were transferred to the disposal of Army Group Center and moved to the south. On September 18, a critical situation developed in the Romney area. Early in the morning on the eastern flank was heard the noise of battle, which during the subsequent Eremini increasingly intensified. Fresh enemy forces. The 9th Cavalry Division and another division together with tanks were advancing from the east on Romney in three columns, approaching the town at a distance of 800 metres. From the high tower of the prison, located on the outskirts of the city, I was able to clearly observe how the enemy was advancing. The 24th Tank Corps was tasked to repel the enemy offensive. To accomplish this task, the corps had at its disposal two battalions of the 10th Motorized Division and several anti-aircraft batteries. Because of the superiority of enemy aircraft, our air reconnaissance was in a difficult condition. Lieutenant Colonel von Barkiewicz, who personally flew out for reconnaissance, with difficulty eluded the Russian fighters. Then followed a raid of enemy aircraft on Romney. In the end, we still managed to hold the town of Romney and the forward command post in our hands. However, the Russians continued to drop off their forces along the Kharkov-Sumy road and unload them at Sumy and Zorovka. To repel these enemy forces, the 24th Panzer Corps transferred here from the area of the cauldron some parts of the SS Division Reich and the 4th Panzer Division, which had travelled here through Konotop and Putivol. The threatened situation of Romney forced me to move my command post back to Konotop on September 19. General von Gier made this decision easier for us by his radiogram, in which he wrote, The transfer of the command post from Romney will not be interpreted by the troops as a manifestation of cowardice on the part of the command of the tank group. In addition, in Konotop, we were in a more favourable position for the upcoming offensive in the direction of Oral Bryansk. The 24th Tank Corps wanted to somewhat delay the offensive on the newly appeared enemy in order to be able to collapse on him with their concentrated forces. Unfortunately, I could not go to the extent of granting this understandable wish, since in that case the SS Reich Division would only be able to participate in this operation for a few days. It was to be transferred as part of the 46th Tank Corps, together with the Great Germania Regiment, to the 4th Tank Group in the vicinity of Roslav. In addition, the unloading of new enemy forces at Seredina Buda and the transfer of enemy troops through Sumy to the north forced hasty action. On this day, Kiev was taken. The 48th Tank Corps of the 1st Tank Group took Gorodyshe and Belusovka. On September 20, we achieved minor success on our eastern flank. The 3rd Panzer Division, against which was the headquarters of the 5th Army of the Russians, continued to fight in the area of the cauldron, to the south acted 25th Motor Division, on the site of which some parts of the enemy managed to break through the encirclement rings. Since September 13, we have captured 30,000 prisoners. On September 20, I visited the 46th Tank Corps. General Fittinghoff reported to me about the difficulties during the last few days of fighting south of Glukov. Especially bravely fought on the side of the Russians were the cadets of the Kharkov Military School under the command of their teachers. The necessity of overcoming minefields and bad weather delayed the course of hostilities. Fierce fighting was still going on near Putival, Shilovka and Bilopoli. I visited the Great Germany Regiment, bravely operating east of Shilovka under the command of its new commander, Colonel Hernlein. On this day the town of Belopoli was occupied. On September 21, the enemy pressure on Glukov increased. North of this city was noted the concentration of Russian troops. We began the offensive at Nedrig. Since the fighting for Kiev began, the 1st Panzer Group captured 43,000 prisoners, the 6th Army 63,000. On September 22, I again went to the front and through Putival went in the direction of Rilsk in order to check the organization of the guard on this threatened section of the front. In Vyazenka, I met at the headquarters of the 17th Panzer Division with General von Arnim, who had recovered from his wound at Stolbsi and had replaced General Baron von Tim a few days before. The enemy was advancing on Glukov and Chalupkovo from the east and northeast, partially encircling our troops defending these points. Two new Russian divisions were noted in front of the front of the 17th Panzer Division. On our return to the command post of the 46th Tank Corps, we came under a heavy fire attack by enemy artillery. 
which fortunately was without any casualties. Then I cordially bade farewell to General Fitinhoff, who together with his corps went to the disposal of the 4th Tank Army. The 17th Tank Division I subordinated directly to the headquarters of the tank group, and the regiment Great German subordinated to the 17th Tank Division, which set the task of destroying the enemy in the area of Glukov. The division fulfilled this task. The total number of prisoners captured in the Kiev area exceeded 290,000 people. Since September 23, began regrouping of forces to carry out a new operation. The direction of the main blow of the second tank group was in the area of Glukov and to the north. As a result of offensive actions of the 4th Panzer Division and SS Division Reich, the enemy in the area of Kamlik was pushed back to the east. Large concentrations of troops on the section of the railroad line Bryansk, Gov testified to the approach of new enemy reserves. September 24. I flew to Smolensk to the headquarters of Army Group Center for a final meeting on the issue of conducting a new offensive. The meeting was also attended by the Commander-in-Chief of Ground Forces and the Chief of General Staff. It was decided that the Army Group will begin the offensive on October 2, and the 2nd Panzer Group, which will operate on the right flank, will go on the offensive earlier, September 30. This difference in the time of the beginning of the offensive was established at my request for the 2nd Tank Group did not have any paved roads in the area of its upcoming offensive. I wanted to take advantage of the short period of good weather remaining in order to reach at least a good road near Oral before the rainy season arrived and to secure the oral Bryansk Road, thus providing a reliable supply route. In addition, I believe that only if I start the offensive two days earlier than the other armies in Army Group Center, I will be provided with strong air support. We used the following days to complete the fighting in the Kiev Cauldron area, to concentrate our corps in order to move to a new offensive, as well as to give the personnel rest and tidy up the material after the strenuous marches and battles during the past months. We could give our brave troops only three days for rest, and even this short rest could not be used by all the compounds of the tank group. For several days the enemy made fierce attacks, apparently with fresh forces east of Glukov and against our bridgehead near Novohod Siversky. The Russian attacks made on September 25 on Belopoli, Glukhov, and Yampol were repulsed. Our troops captured a large number of prisoners. On that day, the headquarters of Army Group North reported to the General Command of Land Forces that with the remaining forces at its disposal, it was unable to continue the offensive against Leningrad. By September 26, the battles in the area of the Kiev Cauldron ended with our victory. The commander of the 5th Army was taken prisoner. I had a conversation with him and asked him some questions. When did they notice in their rear the approach of my tanks? About September 8. Why didn't they leave Kiev after that? We received an order from the front to leave Kiev and withdraw to the east, and were ready to withdraw. But then another order followed, cancelling the previous one and demanding to defend Kiev to the end. The fulfilment of this counter-order led to the destruction of the entire Kiev group of Russian troops. At that time, we were extremely surprised by such actions of the Russian command. The enemy did not repeat such mistakes. We, unfortunately, had to live through the sad experience of the same interference in the course of hostilities. Fighting for Kiev, undoubtedly, meant a major tactical success. However, the question of whether this tactical success also had a major strategic significance remains in doubt. Everything now depended on whether the Germans would be able to achieve decisive results before the onset of winter, perhaps even before the onset of the fall thaw period. True, the planned offensive to squeeze Leningrad into a tighter ring had already been suspended. The Army High Command expected that in the south. The enemy would no longer be able to organize a strong and stubborn defense against the troops of Army Group South. It wanted Army Group South to seize Donbass before the onset of winter and reach the Don River frontier. However, the main blow was to strike a strengthened Army Group center in the direction of Moscow. Was the 